Hello and welcome to Perfectly Paranormal, episode 80. My name's Anna Schmidt, and I'm here every week to share with you true paranormal encounters and information about devils, demons, and dark energy beings that no one else talks about. They truly don't. Today, we are stepping into the dark recesses of the mind and exploring mental health and dark energy beings. Is there a connection? And if so, what is it? And I'm going to share my experience living with a family member who I thought crossed the borders into elevated psychic awareness, but was dubbed mentally ill at a very young age with a soup pot full of various diagnoses, including schizophrenia. Now, I know this is a very controversial topic, but a lot of people ask me about the paranormal connection to mental health issues. So I just thought, I'm going to talk about it. I'm just going to share my experiences and what I understand about mental health and paranormal beings. Now, what got me started on this episode was about a year ago, a viewer on my YouTube channel, she asked the following questions about entities and their connection to mental health conditions, especially schizophrenia. This lady was a mental health worker and she'd witnessed strange and kind of unusual behaviours in some of her clients. And the doctors, they either avoided giving her answers when she asked their opinion, or they simply just didn't know what to say. So here are her questions, and we're going to address them today in in a fair amount of detail. So make sure you've got a great big cup of tea and put your feet up, because this is going to be a rather long episode. Now, question number one. Do dark beings have an easier time getting through to someone with schizophrenia? Question two. Are schizophrenics tapping into dimensions that most people are unaware of? Or is it truly just a world of hallucinations? And question three. Are entities more likely to attach themselves to a person who can easily hear or see them Or do they prefer to stir things up from the shadows to get the reactions they seek? Now, before we start, as I always say, the information shared in this episode today is purely from my energetic perspective about what I've witnessed in my family and through client experiences and also conversations that I've had with mental health workers. Now, that being said, Let's delve into dark energy beings and explore their possible cause or influence on mental health conditions. Now, firstly, let's outline a definition of schizophrenia. Now, this came from dictionary.com. Schizophrenia is defined as a spectrum of mental disorders, which is characterized by emotional dysfunction intellectual deterioration, social isolation, disorganized speech and behaviors, delusions, hallucinations, or a combination of any of these symptoms. Now, when I read that definition, it really got me thinking because I often experience disorganized thinking or heightened emotions, as most people do, especially when I'm tired, or I'm super busy, or I'm stressed, or I haven't eaten enough, or I haven't been drinking enough. My body just simply isn't functioning at an optimum level. And if you've been listening to my podcast long enough, you'll know that I talk about hearing voices from unseen sources internally and externally. And I've been doing this since childhood, and I like my own company. I have to say, I'm not a great people person, especially mass gatherings of people. So could I be classed as socially isolated or antisocial? One of the funny things that I see when I see spirits is that I see sort of energetic body shifting shapes in our environment. But this isn't just at haunted locations. This is everywhere. This is in my home because these beings know I do this work. So they're coming to say hello. They're coming to see if I can help them. Now, sometimes I even see images in my mind, like word flashes or random three to four second movies. And I feel energetic fluctuations in people 
and places and many other spiritual or psychically open people have similar experiences, so they tell me. So what tips you over the edge into thinking that these occurrences are a mental health condition? Now, the medical and scientific community attributes the aforementioned symptoms in the definition of schizophrenia to factors like genetic predisposition, brain chemistry imbalances, and environmental stresses, rather than the possibility of psychic abilities and external spiritual entities. Now, mental health professionals emphasize evidence-based treatments, and I get that. I totally get it, including medication and therapy to manage conditions like schizophrenia. Attributing these experiences to dark entities is just simply not supported by scientific evidence. They just can't prove that these entities exist. Even though many people like me can see them, can hear them, can you know, know that they're there. You see them moving around in the environment. You see them moving very tangible things or flickering the lights or playing with my laptop. I don't take medications. I don't drink alcohol. I'm not on any recreational drugs. I am totally clean and aware of my environment. Some people are just more sensitive to what is around us. Now, I understand the medical approach. And I also think that a holistic approach, including energetic aspects, gives a broader picture of what the person is going through. Now, I want to share with you my experience of living with a parent with schizophrenia. I came from a family with a very, very long mental health background, like spanning generations. My mum used to talk about it all the time on both sides of her family, which I never really understood when I was younger. But now I'm older, I have a much broader understanding of, you know, how it all works. I don't classify myself as a person with a mental health condition, even though it's very possibly in my genes. So from my early teens, I explored what I called heightened spiritual sensitivity. I've always looked at the world in a different way, even before I was a teenager. As far back as like four or five years old, when I'd be in bed and someone would flicker the lights or touch me on the shoulder or pull on my bed blankets, I can still remember that. Now, I didn't make it up. It was simply something that I could feel in the energetic environment. Now, like I said, I looked at the world in a different way. Always have. Still do at 56. And I wanted to explore spiritual and the possible psychic side of hearing and seeing spirits or apparitions and knowing sort of random information that's not mine. But sometimes I get told this information or I'm picking up or sensing information that is simply for someone else. Now, you're going to love this. I had to do all my learning as a youngster in a hidden way probably from around about the age of 11 or 12. And what I would do is that I would usually go to the local library and I would sit there and I would just read whatever books I could get my hands on. Ghosts and spectres and seances and spirit guides and angels and archangels and dark entities and and the whole plethora of the paranormal. And the reason why I went to the library is I very innocently bought home some books one day. And my dad, who was a bit of a sticky beak, didn't like me bringing home books about angels and ghosts and anything really that challenged his beliefs about those subjects. And I was ordered to take them back to the library. So to comply, I thought, right, I'm just going to do what he asks. So I just spent a couple of hours after school because I could walk down to the library from where my high school was. And I would simply just go down there and just read books, just constantly sit in my favorite corner. And I had all my favorite books around me because I didn't want to be rushed off to the doctor and put on pills. Now, I'm saying that is I'm going to expand on that a little bit later. My parents never knew that I could hear voices or see spirits or pick up on changes in the environment. Now, I didn't want medication. I didn't need medication. I functioned normally as a young teenager. 
mentally and emotionally and physically. I mean, yeah, sure, I had all the struggles that every other teenager had. But I went to school. I I had hobbies. I didn't have a huge amount of friends because I'm really a bit of a loner. I still am now. But I didn't feel that I needed medication. I was simply just observing what was in the environment. It didn't frighten me. It didn't scare me. It didn't keep me awake at night. It didn't make me uh, paranoid or anxious or fearful to leave the house. It was simply just something that I felt attuned to. And the other thing too, when it comes to medication, as what I observed from my mum is that I didn't know what the drugs would do to me. As I'd seen many strange and unusual side effects that had happened to my mum for the 50 years, yes, 50 years, of her life where she was on medication. Some people do need medication and I am not doubting that in any way. They needed to support them and to keep them on a level ground. Now I'm talking mentally and emotionally. So they can function in this reality at home, at work, with their friends, with their daily needs, with their routines. Like my mum was on medication for at least 50 years. And if she hadn't have had that medication, I may very well not be here. It's as simple as that. I just, I just wouldn't be here because she would have been put into a mental health institution and probably locked away and never seen again. Now, the energy work is part of a person's overall healing process. No matter how much doctors say, oh, no, no, it has to be medical. Well, I believe in a three-way approach to helping people. I always say, and you're going to roll your eyes because you'll get sick of me saying it again, you see your doctor first, you see your mental health professional, then you see an energy clearer. Now, quite often when I talk to people about this, they choose to start exploring and broadening their thinking. You know, they want to start looking at the spiritual side of themselves. They want to understand why they see what they see, why they hear what they hear. Still on their medication, because remember, it keeps them functioning in the earth reality. And once they've got that functioning in the earth reality, they can then think in sort of an emotionally settled way, in a mentally settled way. They're not going to be frightened or anxious or paranoid or scared about what's around them. Because spirits are around us all the time. Dark entities are around us all the time. I'm going to cover that a little bit later on. So let's not get too sidetracked. Now, I really want to share with you an interesting and slightly odd experience that I witnessed with my mum. This is going to answer the following question. Do dark entities have an easier time getting through to someone with schizophrenia? Now, to answer that question, I say yes, from my energetic perspective. Dark beings don't use labels. They don't use labels like schizophrenia. They're only interested in our vibration and the types of vibrations or frequencies that we create on a daily basis. Now, when you're more open psychically than others, our vibration is different. I've been around people, and how I know this is the thing, I've been around people that can see auras. Now, your aura is, it's sort of the colors that are within your energetic field. So as we're in this physical body, we also have an energy body, which is our soul energy. So the soul energy resides in the physical body and it emanates an energetic field around the physical body. Now, some people see colors in that energetic field. I'm not lucky enough to have that skill, but I'm always fascinated when people go, whoa, your energy field is really bright. Oh my God, look at, the, look at the sparks coming off your energy field. It's white and it's bright and there's little gold flecks. Brighter your energy field, sometimes I think it's more of an attractant to the darker energy beings. They're curious, they want to know, they want to observe. Do you have a vibration that they might like? Can you help them? Same with spirits. Spirits are quite often roaming the earth going, you know what, I'm really sick of being here now. How do I get out? I'm ready to go to mum, dad, the dog. I just really want to leave this earth reality. So let's get back to this story. I know I get sidetracked, but there's there's always a reason and I do apologize. Now, some people simply don't care about the psychic awareness. 
They just don't care. It's not part of their reality. They can't be bothered. Or they don't want to understand how to utilize these skills if they do that they, well, if they know that they do have them. They just simply like, oh, it's all too hard. What am I going to get out of that? How does it help me? Now, in my mum's time, she was born in 1944. So you're looking at the 50s and the 60s when she was sort of in our teenagers and in her 20 years. It was a bit of a taboo topic in those days. You didn't talk about spiritual self. You didn't talk about psychic abilities. You were seen as odd or weird or away with the fairies. But in the last 20 years or so, since the year 2000, I'm finding that people are starting to be more accepting of other possibilities that are available to explain the components of mental health difficulties. Now, my mum, she fitted into that early category back in the 60s. And I want to share this short experience with you, and you're going to understand why I'm sharing it. This will highlight different aspects of her condition and her very possible openness to spirits or other maybe slightly naughty entities that are in our environment. The ones that are the tricksters or the ones that will make you do things to then elevate your fear, paranoia, guilt, blame, shame. And then you create that food that they want that I'm always talking about. Now, I've called her story The Man in the Air Vent. Now, my mum lived in the family home for the last sort of 44 years. And it was probably about seven years after my dad passed away. And I'd moved out many years before that. And I took on the care of my mum. She did need support. So I would visit her every second day. And I'd see to her needs, such as doing any shopping she needed, her pill delivery, bringing her dinners and spending time sort of watching TV and chatting and laughing, sort of usually till about sort of 9pm most nights. So on this particular day, I arrived at my mum's house at around 6pm. And I will have to say, I'm sharing this story because she's no longer with us anymore. My dad's not here, my mum's not here. And she wouldn't mind if I was sharing this because it really does highlight how paranormal entities can manipulate people's minds. This is how I thought about it. I mean, it may have been a delusion or a hallucination if you want to use those medical terms. But from what I know of this woman, you know, because I've known her all my life, she was very psychic very open, but she went down the mental health path because that's what you did in the 50s and the 60s. Now, she was a really funny lady, but she was a little bit odd. It's probably why I'm a little bit odd too. It's just, you know, we're all individuals. We're sort of these funny characters. Now, she was a little bit naughty too, and she would have bouts of not taking her medication properly. She would assume that she felt better, so I'm not going to take those pills today. As we found out, that was something she did quite often. Now, she was quite safe in the house. She looked after herself. There was no issues in that sense. But when she didn't take her antipsychotic medication, she would go into irrational sort of frenzied behaviours, such as, you're going to love this, she gathered up all the clocks in the house one day. This was the night that I was visiting. She'd gathered up all the clocks in the house and she'd thrown them out the top window onto the front lawn because the little man who lived in the lounge room ceiling air vent told her that the clocks were bombs. I know, I was the same when I heard that. I was like, what? What is going on? What are you talking about? I was always very rational with my mum. I didn't want to play into her fears, so I stayed very neutral. She didn't know what to do. She was in the house by herself and this little man kept saying to her, the clocks are bombs, the clocks are bombs, you have to get rid of the clocks, the clocks will blow up the house, you'll have nowhere to live, you'll get hurt. And this voice just constantly pinged away at her. This is what she told me. So she panicked in that moment, not knowing what else to do. And she simply threw all the clocks out onto the front lawn. And that was her way of disposing of the perceived threat in the best way that she could. She told me that this little man who lived in the air vent, he would whisper all night long if she didn't take her medication. 
And his voice really it didn't really frighten her. She said to me she wasn't scared, but she was more annoyed. Like she didn't invite him into the house. She didn't know who or what it was. And it just simply annoyed her constantly, and she just couldn't rest. Now, was this little voice in the air vent in the ceiling? Was it just wafting around in the ceiling? Was it wafting around above her head? Was it present in her energy field? Because quite often I'll find that with clients is that they're going, no, it's in the house, it's in the house. And I'm going, nope, I can feel it. It's in your energy field. It's really hard to define the understanding of where these entities are for people that don't work with a paranormal and they just simply think it's in the environment. Now, my mum's heightened mental state left her vulnerable to extreme mental, emotional and physical behaviours. And the medication that she took, it really helped to keep her on an even keel so that she could function in a reasonable way. And if we sort of backtrack here a little bit, in the 1950s, when she was around about the age of 16, she'd always been different to others, a bit like me had odd ideas, odd ways of expressing herself, odd, she just said things in really random, weird ways, and people didn't really understand her. Now, what did they do with people like that in the 1950s? You know, her eccentric behaviours were seen as not normal. And off she was whisked to the doctor, who simply put her on pills. And what the pills did was they immediately quashed any abnormality in her. She told me that they affected her speech. They made her think slower. She moved slower. She had really good memory. She passed away at around about the age of 76. But she could remember right back. She could tell me all the names of every tablet she'd ever been on. Now, when she started taking the medication, If this was a psychic ability that she had sensing this funny little man in the air vent, which may have well, you know, may have very well been a spirit or a dark energy being who was being a bit naughty, they disappeared, they vanished, they were just put on the back burner, they weren't part of her reality anymore. So when she started taking the medication, psychic abilities being a possible spiritual cause of her hearing the man in the air vent, or as a component of her odd irrational behaviours, it was just simply unheard of and it would have had you laughed out of the doctor's office. Now, I don't know if she or her family would have coped mentally with the possibility of her issues being partly spiritual or psychic. I mean, what would they have done with that? In her day, they just simply put you on the tablets. Let's get you back to normal and away you go. No holistic approaches in those days. Spirituality was never mentioned in any of the family conversations that I remember. And I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, even though these people went to church most Sundays. But I know religion is different to spirituality, but it is a belief in a higher power. It is belief in angels and archangels and spirit guides and God and Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and whatever words you want to use to describe your spiritual beliefs. That is believing in something other than what we see in this tangible reality. And one of the other quirky, funny things that my mum used to do is that she knew I'd be coming. It was Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then it sort of alternated the next week when I would be turning up. And she never really knew when I was coming. She just knew it was every second day and she didn't know the time. But I have to tell you, I would turn up at the back door, knock and let myself in. She'd be standing there at the kitchen with the kettle boiled, pouring the hot water into the cup of tea that she'd made me. And I'd look at her and go, did you know I was coming? She said, yep, I knew you were on the way. How did she know? Now, there's got to be some psychic component in that. Was it that we were simply connected as family members and that she knew me and she knew my routines? But remember, The days that every second day alternated and it's just, I just still remember that cup of tea incident and I tell people about that quite often. It's like she knew, she had psychic abilities there that maybe frightened her or she didn't want to explore them. She didn't didn't see how they could benefit her in her life. Now I have to say that I do think very differently from my mum and her generation. 
And I feel that quite often it all comes down to an individual's capacity and coping mechanisms to deal with unseen goings on in this reality. I observe. I'm not frightened. I'm not scared. I approach the unknown with curiosity and sort of a a deep wanting to know more and more and more about what's going on in the invisible reality that surrounds us. But I must say, I must say this too, that if I ever felt that I was dysfunctional mentally, emotionally, I couldn't cope, there were traumas in my life that I couldn't cope with, I of course would go and see a mental health counsellor or a therapist. Anyway, let's move on to our second question. Are schizophrenics tapping into dimensions that most people are unable to experience or is it truly a world of hallucinations? Now, from my energetic perspective, I'm going to answer yes again. What society does is that it coats the unseen world with fear and paranoia and anxiety and the mass population is brainwashed into fear and drama responses. You see it all the time. When it comes to people with goings on in their home, paranormal happenings in their home, they instantly go into fear instead of observing in a neutral, calm way. Some people just love the drama. Now, dimensions. When it comes to talking about interdimensional realities, I mean, can science even prove that? I don't know. I'm still on the psychic path here when I talk about these things. I feel that there are many realities or dimensions all intermingling and overlapping with our earth reality all at the same time. People talk about heaven being above us and hell being below us. No, I'm sorry to say, I think it's all sort of intermingled in this very reality that we are in. It's all happening in the one space at the one time. And some people, some people who have a very strong sixth sense, whether it's clairsentience or clairaudience or clairvoyance, which simply means seeing, hearing, knowing, they're more sensitive to what is going on in the world around us. Look, I'm one of these people. This is why I can talk about it. And I'm not afraid to talk about it because I know it's real. I know it is the truth. I have to say that I have what I call my paranormal radar or my spidey senses, and they pick up on the changes in the energy around us. My eyes, quite often my peripheral vision, when I'm working on my computer, I'll see movements in my peripheral vision. And people will debunk it and go, oh, it's the light moving, oh, it's the curtains moving, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. But I know where I sit in my house. There's no windows open. And the way that the, the energy moves in my peripheral vision, it's very much like a person moving. It's quite fascinating to see it. I get very excited. It's like, oh, how do I explain it? It's literally like someone wearing an invisibility cloak. And it's slightly different to the background, but you kind of see through it, but you kind of can't see through it. It's got this sort of wavering, shimmeringness. <laughs> it's not a word, but you know where I'm going with that. It's got this shimmeriness about it. And I'm like, ah, I see you. And quite often they flit off when I say that. And usually it's just spirits in my house. They know I've been doing energy work that day and they've felt the vibe and they've come to go, please help me. I don't want to be here anymore. Simply what they do. They're not here to frighten me or hurt me in any way. Myself and many others, like I just said, see, hear and feel different energy. And we talk openly about it. It's really, really good that you can just express yourself in this way. I know that I've helped many people feel less afraid of the energy world. And this is talking about your angels, archangels, spirit guides, and also the dark energy beings, and also the elementals, such as the gnomes that get around in people's homes causing mischief. Now, I want to share a little, very short story. I have a friend with an eight-year-old son. Now, this eight-year-old boy... He sees, hears, and senses energy, energy beings, spirits, dark energy beings. Sometimes they're around him, sometimes they're in the environment. Now, is he mentally ill? Not from his parents' perspective. He goes to school, he plays footy, he goes to scouts, he plays with his pets, he has friends that come over for a sleepover, and he is a happy, well-adjusted child, mentally, emotionally, physically. 
His parents, more so his mum, she fully understands that he has heightened senses and she finds it fascinating. And through his experiences, she is learning a lot about the energy world that's around us. And she's a good friend of mine now, and we talk about this quite often. And it's not mental illness. In his case, it is simply a young boy that can see things that other people can't. Now, he's been to see psychologists in the past, mainly for anxiety issues, but medication wasn't deemed necessary. Now, he was anxious because he can see things in the environment. He can feel things in the environment. And of course, he's only eight. So, so young. He was born with these gifts, born with these skills. And luckily, I met this lady and we talk about it a lot. I talk to her son. She talks to her son. We make it normal because it is normal. Seeing these entities in the environment is normal. Now, I talked about one of his experiences back in episode 56 with a rather interesting dark entity that this boy called the Dust Man. So if you want to hear about that, go back and check out episode 56. Now, my third question today, are dark entities more likely to attach themselves to a person that can easily hear or see them, or do they prefer to kind of stir up things from the shadows to get the reactions they seek? Well, I have to tell you that just as every one of us is different, Every one of these entities are different too. They each have their own ways of triggering us. They each have their own ways of checking out our energy. Because every one of us is different in our reaction, whether we've got a mental health condition or not. The entities in our environment choose different approaches depending on their observation and what they read in our energy as points of weakness or vulnerability. The people often ask me, how do they read your energy? I can't answer that question. Oh dear. I just don't know how they read our energy. They just simply are able to tell what our vulnerabilities are. And if I ever do find out how they do it, I will definitely do an episode on that. Now, I thought the easiest way to explain, are dark entities more likely to attach themselves to a person that can easily hear or see them Or do they prefer to kind of stir up things from the shadows to get the reactions they seek? Would be, I've made a list because I'm very OCD and I like lists. And I've come up with 13 possibilities. So here are a few different aspects that I have identified. Number one, does the person have the desired energetic food vibration to feed a particular energy being's needs? Because we know these entities are only attracted to us for particular reasons. It is simply what they do. They don't care what your hair colour is, whether you've got a mental health condition. It's all about the food. And are you easy to access? Now, number two, is the person's sixth sense open enough to sense their presence or to react in their presence? Are you going to be freaked out by them being around? Or are you simply going to go, I see you. What are you up to? What do you want? I don't want you here. Can you please leave now? Please leave my home. I can't help you. I don't know how to help you. Please leave. Number three, is the person easily frightened? Because believe it or not, as I mentioned earlier, society has trained us to go into fear, just create paranormal drama. It is just simply what people want because they want the adrenaline rush. Is it the fact that maybe a person with a mental health issue is feeling a bit lonely, is feeling a bit lost, and does the paranormal drama actually get them attention from the entities, but also from the people? When you are frightened, you can therefore be easily manipulated, which leads us into number four. Is the person easily manipulated? Do they have preconceived ideas or fears about the paranormal and what they want from us? Is it the paranormal? Is it just simply a curtain wafting in a breeze or you've got possums in your ceiling 
or you've got air pressure built up in the pipes and it's sort of rattling along the walls. You've always got to do the debunking. Number five, is the person easily triggered or switched on enough to see through the paranormal trickery? These supernatural tricksters, they do love to play games. Number six, is the person an easy target or are they strong and not interested, like both mentally and emotionally? They can't be triggered. I've got friends who are partners and the female's extremely triggered, whereas the partner is like, nah, don't believe in it. It's not real. They can't hurt me. Nah, don't believe in it. He doesn't get triggered at all. They don't go near him. He's not an easy target, whereas she is. These beings don't show interest if the person is not vulnerable in some way. They're just not going to bother. These are energy beings. They're not going to waste their energy on people that aren't going to give them what they want. It's just simply how they work. Now, number seven, will the person create their desired energetic food? Because entities that love the vibration of hatred aren't necessarily going to hang on to someone whose main trigger emotion is sadness or despair because it just doesn't feed what they need. This is just my understanding of how it all works. I don't have all the information. I don't think anyone does, anyone living that is. They seriously are only self-interested. That is all that they do is that they're self-interested in what they can get you to create. Now, whether you've got a mental health condition or not, these beings are in our environment. Now, number eight, the environmental factor. Can a person be triggered by environmental changes in the home or when they're driving down the highway or whether they're walking down the street or they're walking to the pub or going to the bowls club or walking through the supermarket and all of a sudden they're crying and they don't know why? Is that a mental health issue? Or is that simply that the person is very, very sensitive and picking up on the energy that someone else has left in that location? And the way I explain this is, if you walk into a room where people have been really angry and they've been arguing and they've been fighting, even when those people leave that room, that anger and that rage and that hostility is still present in that room. The energetic imprints have been laid into the furniture, the walls, the space within that room. Some people are sensitive and can walk in and all of a sudden their behaviours change. And they're like, why do I feel so angry? I just want to punch the wall. And the people with them are like, what's got into you? Why have you changed so rapidly? And they're like, I don't know. I don't know why I feel like this. Sometimes it's not you. It's the environment around you. Because as far as I know, dark and demonic beings don't leave imprints in locations. Now, I don't 100% know that. What is in our environment is what we create. Every thought, every word, every action, every reaction creates a vibration. And the happy wafting vibrations, they just sort of waft around and they're all happy and lovely. The heavier Darker emotions like despair and sorrow and sadness and guilt and shame and resentment, they sink into the environment because remember, everything's a vibration. Emotions are simply energy in motion. So, what you touch, when you feel a certain way, what you sit on, what you sleep on, you leave your imprints everywhere. Believe me, I find it in people's homes all the time. So, where were we? Number nine. Is the person easily triggered physically? I know this one. Physically is one way they get to me. Is that being tripped, banging my hands, being pushed, being poked, being prodded, usually when I'm in bed, because that's my vulnerable time of the day. I am highly sensitive to the environment around us. I am spiritually and psychically switched on 24-7. So I know when I'm experiencing something that it's not me, there's something in the environment, either wanting my attention or feeling threatened, or when I was going through a lot of being attacked by uh, hoodoo, sorcery and magic, that was interesting because I learned a whole heap of new sensations to know when someone 
This is living people are trying to attack you from a distance. It's all energetic sensitivity is what I'm trying to say. I always say things the long way. So number 10, can the entities get the desired reaction when the person is sleeping or in their dreams? Absolutely, yes. Some people are sensitive in their dream state. I have a friend who, she's not particularly sensitive to the environment, but she sees things in her dreams. She's very much a lucid dreamer. She interacts in her dreams. She tells me about her dreams. It's really fascinating. She experiences these entities and she experiences when people are projecting sort of magic or sorcery or they're wanting her to feel a certain way. She feels what they're sending, but in her dreams. So that is another way that the entities or people can actually interact with you. Because remember, everything is about intention. Now, number 11, is someone vulnerable when they're in an addictive state? I'm not talking about mental health medication. I'm talking about addictive states, as in smoking weed, sort of tripping out on mushrooms or full to the brim with alcohol. Even when people have hoarding or gambling addictions, they live in an altered mind state. Sometimes it's from trauma they're living in an altered mind state. And sometimes addictions are a way that these entities can stir people up to get the reactions that they want. Now, number 12, if the person has paranormal addiction tendencies, that's me putting my hand up here. I love the paranormal. I want to know about it. I want to learn everything I can about it. And because I put that out there with my vibration, not only my words, but with my thoughts and my vibration, of course, I have the experiences, law of attraction, what you put out will come to you. So when people have these paranormal addiction tendencies, they can be triggered easier by the entities because the entities know that the person loves the unknown. They love that that surprising, those knocks on the walls or the taps on the windows or the tugs on the blanket. They're not frightened. They're going to, as they, they don't go into, oh my God, they're going to, wow, I want to know more. Can you do it again, please? <laughs> This is one thing with paranormal entities. Remember I said they read your energy. If they know you love the paranormal, they will use all of the triggering mechanisms that you see in the movies, doors slamming, lights flickering, knocking, scratching, poking, you know, all those sorts of things. Because they see it in the movies and they see people's reactions and they're like, right. They rub their hands together and they go, that's how we can get to little Freddy, or that's what Joan's going to react to. If they're not getting the attention they want, they will find something in the environment to get your attention. Okay, so number 13. I don't know why there's 13. 13 is just one of those numbers, isn't it, when you're talking about the paranormal. So number 13, is the person involved in occultism, black magic, satanic practices. This is the very dark end of the scale. These practices may lead people into mental health conditions because they destabilize the mind. You are giving access. You are inviting entities. You are invoking them. You are summoning them to come to you. And once you've got them, They're very hard to get rid of. If you don't know where they are, what they're doing, why they're doing it, what they want from you, because you can't make contracts with these beings, think you can manipulate them like puppets. Uh, No, they manipulate us like puppets. Because like number 12, I think people who go into occultism and satanic practices, they have a little bit of a paranormal addiction. They can be destabilized and head into mental health conditions, because that's what these beings do. They get in your mind and they mess with your thinking. If that's how you're vulnerable, that's how they're going to do it. So we've come to the end of our list, but that's not the end of this episode. The altered states of consciousness and perceptual experiences that are characterized by schizophrenia symptoms may make individuals more susceptible to spiritual interference from lower vibrational beings. 
And remember, these entities are drawn to psychically open people in general, but also to those who are vulnerable mentally and emotionally. I always say to people, as part of that holistic approach, energetic clearings are really, really important, and then using some form of energetic protection practices as part of an overall care plan. This can assist people in helping to lessen the paranormal effects that these beings have on people. Because you can't get rid of them. Remember, they're in our environment all the time. Now, the question of whether mental health issues are real medical conditions or is the result of dark entity influence, it simply is a complex question. And I can't give you a yes or no. I can only give you my perspective, what I've witnessed, what I've experienced. But I think lower vibrational entities play a part in our well-being. They really do. They challenge us. They challenge us to be resilient and overcoming challenges in our life choices. They really are fascinating. So next time you think that you've got a dark entity around you, don't be frightened of it. Observe it. Question it. Ask them questions and see how you pick up their responses. Do you hear an answer? Do you see an answer? I'm just saying be aware and observe. Be aware and observe these beings in our reality. And from my years of observing these fascinating beings, I've come to the conclusion that energy beings, they don't cause the issues within us whether mental health or medical or spiritual emergencies or otherwise. But these dark energy beings are drawn to vulnerabilities that already lie within us, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. And they will always continue to test our weaknesses. When you're aware of it, you can take control of your life. You really can. And if you like this episode, you want to learn more about the paranormal. I'm always sharing new information that nobody else does. Please hit the subscribe button. Send me a comment. Send me one of your stories. Now, before we finish up today, I want to share the following observation with you from a lady named Jess. Now, Jess is the mental health worker who posed the three questions in this episode today. Now, Jess wrote to me, and this is what she said. Hi, Anna. I would be interested in your opinion, please. I am sensitive to energy and have experienced dizziness and sudden onset headaches on more than one occasion when visiting one of my clients. It's my personal belief that she is being tortured, now this was the client's words, by dark beings that are very much attached to her. And this was my response to Jess's question or Jess's email. Your sudden dizziness and headaches mentioned are common signs experienced by many people, paranormal presence. Now, I've spoken to many people about this and I've experienced it myself. And those types of signs are a way of the body, a way of the physical body alerting us to lower vibrational presence. Now, a message from the client to Jess, who is the mental health worker, and this is what the client writes. I'm interested in the spiritual perspective because it's my belief that Western medicine leaves the energetic self out of the holistic healing process. And this is what Jess wrote to me. In the case of this client I mentioned above, I could have been fired for giving spiritual advice even though it was apparent that it was exactly what she needed. I visited her the other day and she told me that she was trying to work on self-healing and felt that one of the disruptive beings that had been annoying her simply left. And I told her you'd said about the energy field, getting used to the beings being present. And she totally agreed. She said that it was nice to feel relief when the energy being left but it also felt really weird and odd without it being there because it had been there for something like 20 years. And Jess told me that she gave this lady a copy of my book called The Darkness Around Us. 
which is a reference guide that I wrote for people so that they could get a basic understanding of who these entities are, why they're here, what they're up to, how they affect us. Once you understand them, you're not frightened of them anymore. You start to observe and what she could do to improve the situation. And she said that she was very grateful for the book and said that it was just what she needed. Well, there you go. Wowzers, what a long episode. But I have to tell you, it was well worth it. And I hope that the information and the perspectives that I've shared with you today have offered you some food for thought about mental health conditions, about the environment, about the connection between paranormal entities and mental health conditions. So stay tuned next week for episode 81, where we're going to be challenged by the world of paranormal sceptics and their questions such as, are ghosts real? Does paranormal activity exist or is it just a state of mind? I have to tell you, I have to say that I love sceptics and I can't wait to share some slightly funny and not so funny experiences with you about paranormal sceptics that I've encountered through my energy clearing work. So stay tuned for that episode. So thank you for joining me today. And don't forget, if you want to share a paranormal experience just with myself, or you would like me to share one of your experiences through my podcast, you can do a voice recording, or you can write out your experience and I will read it exactly as you have written. You can email me at spiritualbeing44 at gmail.com. And for information on paranormal house clearing, you can visit my website, Spiritual Being. You will find the address in the description box. And I look forward to sharing this spooky space again with you next week. And remember, life is perfectly paranormal. <laughs>